Um, thank you all for joining the, another Ripple event. Um, our goal with Ripple is to um, allow for speakers such as uh, BK Fulton, who offer a lot of experiences, a lot of insight, to um, share their knowledge and their experiences with um, young professionals, college students, people who are still looking for ways to, to um, remain active and figure out their passions in life. Um, so the way this call is going to work out is uh, I'm going to be going briefly over uh, Mr. Fulton's um, experience. And then after that, I will um, pass over the mic to Mr. Fulton, who will be uh, engaging in some Q&A, uh, uh, some moderate Q&A um, between me. And then after that, I will pass it off to Michael, another team member on Ripple, who will um, uh, handle the Q&A portion of this call for the last 30-ish minutes. So um, without further ado, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bilton, uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Fulton, so much for coming today. If everyone could give him a, a huge uh, virtual round of applause. Um, uh, Mr. Fulton has done a, a tremendous amount uh, throughout his career. Uh, this might actually take um, the whole call if I really went over all the accolades and the uh, accomplishments he's done. Um, he is currently the chairman and the CEO of Solidify Productions which is a film, a full feature film, stage, and TV investment and production company. They were founded in 2017, and they have released dozens upon dozens of books, um, movies, TV shows, some podcasts, songs, um, you name it, and uh, Solidify has done that. Um, and their, their mission is to create a more inclusive and representative um, uh, point of view for most of media uh, as we see it. Um, and they're definitely going about that with um, the movies and the TV shows that they've been releasing. Uh, they currently have a TV show in on Netflix called uh, Love Doc, oh sorry, a movie on Netflix called Love.com. And uh, Mr. Fulton actually just released a movie um, uh, called uh, one, uh, one Angry Black Man, which is uh, just a, an amazing movie. I recommend everyone to um, watch it and really learn by the experiences and the insight that the movie offered. Um, he is also, uh, was the uh, was a former president for Verizon. Um, and after that, he joined Solidify. Um, so he has a lot of management experience. He's done um, a tremendous amount with the media space. And before that, he has um, received degrees from Virginia Tech, um, NYU Law, MIT. Um, and so a lot of his, Educational experiences have led him to where he is right now uh, in the media space, but along the journey, he's had um, opportunities in management. He's started his own patented product. Um, he's an entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, I can go ahead and pass it off to Mr. Fulton, who um, by all means uh, can, uh, I'm sure I miss a lot of um, your accolades if you want to share about that, and then we can go ahead and go over some of your other experiences. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you, even virtually. Uh, it's kind of fun to be able to use this technology. In a previous career, I was one of the advocates for what was called bridging the digital divide or digital opportunity. And the premise was that we would provide connectivity for people all over the world because there a time would come where having these technologies would be critically important for a civil society, for sharing and engaging. And um, I had no idea how prolific this world of technology would become, but it's up to all of us to use the tools of our time to lift others as we climb. And uh, my career has benefited tremendously from technology. As you've heard, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, I love technology, but I also love art. And so I'm a mashup of the two. And um, we've done, we're the first uh, independent film company in the history of cinema to do four features in our first year. Um, I wrote eight books last year. And uh, we also have a TV network, about 400 hours on the TV network. It's on Apple TV, uh, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and all mobile phones. It's called Soul Vision TV. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that we're ramping up. And uh, we produce a magazine called Soul Vision Magazine. We've had the founder of Netflix. 
uh, Quincy Jones, Stevie Wonder, uh, just had the general counsel of, uh, uh, the former general counsel of Airbnb and current chief ethics officer uh, on the cover of this current issue. Um, and we highlight the world. And the thing that is important, I think, is to help all people, women, minorities, old, young, to appreciate that if they still have breath and they still have some passion, they can achieve at the highest level. And you don't just have to be good at one thing. You can be good at many things. As you heard, I have an album, I'm actually singing on the album. And um, you know, I have a wonderful wife who's my muse, so it helps to be motivated. But be that as it may, um, enough about me. Why don't we uh, get into what questions you may have um, about my career or the current projects we're doing. We have stuff in the art space, stuff in the technology space, and then just general uh, questions about how I got to where I am. I'm an open book. I believe in sharing blueprints. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. When I was in college, I wrote a 50 year plan a little over 30 years ago. And basically, okay. I, uh, oh. basically I lived my life according to that plan. Uh, go ahead, Marvin. Yeah, so um, the first question that um, the audience kind of wanted to go uh, do, for you to go deeper on was um, just your inspiration behind Solidify Productions, because um, a lot of your previous experience has been in the management entrepreneurial sector. So what kind of pushed you towards the media space and more specifically um, behind creating a production company that is so adamant on like inclusive narratives on making sure that the, the kinds of media that you're creating are um, representative of the kinds of people that you uh, work with and are around. Sure. So Solidify, first the name. So everybody has a soul. So I wanted to be inclusive. So we wanted soul in the name. Um, it's a play on the word Solidify because coming together, we're stronger. And then fly, the fly part, because I had to make it cool. If we make something that's not cool, nobody's going to want to check it out. So solidify. The Y is in the shape of a butterfly. And it has all the colors of the people in the world, all the resources that we have to share because we live on the same rock. And the thing that makes us one, the blood, we're all a part of the human family. The butterfly also signifies a transition from a caterpillar to working on yourself because it takes work and then blossoming as a butterfly and flying up and flying towards your dreams or goals. And so that's the basis for the company um, and how we came up with the brand and the, and the imagery. But if we go back a little bit and why a production company instead of something else. Like I shared with you, I retired relatively early, but I wrote a plan to retire by my 50th birthday. And that plan included spending the second half of my life. So I spent my first 49 years, 348 days, the first 50 years doing what I was trained to do. And now I get to spend the rest of my life doing what I feel God made me to do. And that's to tell these stories. And so when I retired, I thought maybe I, I have a lot of preachers in my family, some educators, both my parents are educators. So I thought maybe I'd do something educational. I actually thought about becoming a university professor. And I talked to a few presidents of some universities. And I thought about maybe preaching or something, getting into that. But then that, mean, that meant I would have to go back to divinity school, perhaps, or I actually wanted to church. And then I, I looked at the young people today, my own children, my wife and I are raising you know, three young men and um, they don't spend a lot of time in church. They spend a lot of time on computer screens and with their phones and you know, trying to get likes and trying to get hearts on IG. So I realized that that's something that I wanted to influence. And we live in a celebrity culture and so if I could influence a celebrity 
then I could provide a different type of messaging because I was starting to get upset with the messaging that was out there. The, the, the typical messaging out there is very stereotypical, especially as to minorities and women. Um, for me, when I was in college in engineering school, the first couple of years didn't go so great. And I was actually going to leave. Um, I was flunking out to be frank. And then I went to the library to plan my escape. And I found myself in the E185.5 section of the Dewey Decimal System, which is the section on African American. And um, I started reading about all these inventions and contributions, first open heart surgery, blood plasma, the filament for the light bulb, the patent drawings for the telephone. And I was like, nobody ever told me this. And I got upset, I got angry. And I started, I, I changed my approach to school. I went to class, I read my books, my grades went up. Go figure, read the, read the books, go to class. Yeah, you know, things work out. I became friends with my professors. I started mentoring other students and hanging around students that were about excellence and achievement. And it made all the difference. So now, and so I, I went from the probation list to the dean's list, to the board of Virginia Tech. I was flying in a jet to help govern the school. And so now fast forward to my retirement and the, the, the finer point on the answer, I realized that celebrity culture screens phones. So I wanted to, I wanted to be a part of that movement. And also I wanted to tell an achievement story. So the stories that I was reading about inventions and creations were about achievement and success. Everything else I was getting was slavery stories, uh, domestic violence stories, stories about difficulties between races or people. And those things weren't helping me to become the best version of myself. The success stories were. So I said to myself, if reading about the accomplishments of my people could help me to totally change my life. And if I could put it on the big screen, put it in books and magazines, have great actors and great sound, then I could change the life of a lot of people. We're more alike than different. It's a crazy world that tries to separate us. None of us know where the cure for Alzheimer's is coming from. None of us knows where the cure for ALS is coming from. But what I do know is that if we work together, we can figure it out. But we have to invest in everybody. So Solidify was born. And I realized that media is one of the most powerful tools available to humanity. And we can use it for good or we can use it for bad. I choose to use it for good. In our world right now, there's a lot of indoctrination about who each person is or group is. And we're, we, we teach indoctrination a little bit more than we teach critical thinking in some circles. What I want to do is close the gap between indoctrination and critical thinking so that, and then that place is where the truth is. And it respects you and pushes you to respect me because you find, we found out more about each other. I don't know enough about many communities. And so I'm always learning and I always want to know more and I can tell these stories through media, through film. And so that's what we aim to do. Great, thank you very much for sharing that. I definitely agree with uh, a lot of your viewpoints and uh, Muhammad's connection right now is a little bit unstable. So I'll just take it over from here on out. Um, our next question was, how has your experience with Verizon helped you pursue your media endeavors? Were there any skills that translated well from the tech world? And uh, if you can speak a little bit about that, that would be great. Sure. Uh, I love Verizon. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I just, uh, no, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Verizon taught me about the importance of data. In Verizon, we had a, a hierarchy, but the data won the day. So if you were a junior manager and you had a really good idea that was supported by data, the company would get behind it. 
um, it wasn't about where the senior person said this, we should go with it because they're senior. The company was more, well, what does the data tell us? It was like a, a, a great place for an engineering mind. And, um, and it was the kind of company that was big enough to absorb all the interests that I may have had. When I started out with the company, I was in a strategy group and corporate responsibility. So I did the first three corporate responsibility reports, created all the training for corporate responsibility, but also helped to develop the strategy to get uh, bills passed so that we could deliver Fios TV. So if any of you have Fios TV, it wouldn't be there without some of us who had to work and go lobby Congress. And so I learned that skill set and, and, and perfected that skill set while I was at Verizon. And then we created a thing called Community Studio, where we had um, nonprofit organizations bringing their best content and making it available for our customers. Um, it's where I came up with the words, readers become leaders, because Verizon always invested in reading programs. And when you think from a business point of view, who buys technology service? Who buys sophisticated applications? It's typically people with a better understanding of the world, or better training or education. And so I learned about strategic philanthropy. So when our business, we do giving back, we um, select the businesses that we will invest in based on a strategy that advances a more inclusive narrative that reaches the widest audience, that is informed by data. Got it. Yeah. And for sure, corporate social responsibility is such a big uh, trend recently that's been going on. And me, myself, I'm a social uh, corporate responsibility intern at a consulting firm. So I can definitely get where you're coming from. And um, we talked a little bit about what translated well from Verizon. What are some of the difficult things that you had to learn about movie production? Wow. Some of the difficult things. Artists are mercurial. Um, coming out of a world where, okay, here's the data, here's what we're going to do, everybody align so we can maximize profit. So that's business. Art is, how do I feel today? Am I inspired? I think I want to do it this way today. Maybe I'll do it this way tomorrow. And when they're spending my money, that don't work, you know, because that takes time and time is money. You know, you're on a production set and you may be spending, you know, 10 grand a day. So you want that to end quickly. And so one of the toughest things to, to learn was that, you know, somebody has to be the grown up and put a stop to things um, that you need a really good producer who can keep the trains running. And um, we brought in people who we thought could do that, but uh, over you know, 12 films now, I have a stronger appreciation, a greater appreciation for having the right people in the right seats. And, um, and so, it, I mean, it's, it wasn't difficult to learn per se, but it was important to learn. And I think, um, I think you know, our films have gotten better and our approaches to getting them distributed has gotten better. Here's a little economics for the film industry. So in any given year, worldwide, 8,000 to 10,000 films are made per year. And in that same year, only two to 4% actually get distribution. So most films that are done never get seen. So then if we come back to shorts and things you do on your cell phone, it's hundreds of thousands of pieces of video, most of which will never be seen in any kind of massive way. Contrast our business, all five of the feature films that we've released have received worldwide distribution, have been profitable, and uh, so I'm happy. But I, I, I credit that to being a businessman in show business. So I'm not just about the show, I'm also about the business. And if I were a young person who was interested in getting into this space, learn the business, learn the business, because you can keep going, you can make it sustainable. Because if our, if our films are not good, if they're not, don't have that flyness to them, if they're not cool, if they don't appeal to some kind of demand, then
then you make one film and you're done. You don't get your money back. You bust it. And so you don't recoup, as we call it in the industry. But if you plan and you pull together the right team, you keep your budgets low, and you begin to build relationships with all the pieces of the food chain, particularly with distributors who will get your film out there, you learn how to market, uh, then you can do pretty well. The other big lesson was that if you're in the film finance business, you're in the marketing business. And so have a good marketer on the team or a good marketing company. Um, in the old world, you know, pre-2000, you made a film for you know, four or five million dollars and maybe you put you know three or four million in it you match the budget for your what's called p a prints and advertising or marketing for sure um in today's world you make a film you may spend twice your budget to market the film so that was an important lesson to learn and you can guess why we're in a 500 channel world Everybody's Zooming or doing stuff on IGTV or YouTube. So there's so much competition for our attention that now when I make a film, I've got to figure out how to let people know that my film is there. And um, that takes marketing, major marketing, TV, some radio, um, but really TV. Uh, that makes a difference. We're doing a lot of social media marketing, but... Uh, looking forward to the day when we can do a big spend on TV. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to hear about um, your production company and, and the success, just given the economics, as you said, of the film production industry. Another question that we had uh, was, uh, do you have a favorite film? And if so, how has that influenced you? Wow. My absolute favorite film is the five heartbeats by my friend, Robert Townsend. I like that film because he did it on a hope and a prayer. It, it touches the heartstrings. It's about music and I love music. And I think music is a Quincy Jones taught me it's a universal language. And, um, and the movie did terrible at the box office, hmm. but it's easily on many people's, especially many African-Americans top five, definitely in their top 10. The movie did really well in the theatrical, I mean, in the home run. At, so at homes and at, at DVD rentals and stuff back when there was a blockbuster. Um, and, then, and then Netflix came later, but it did well in the home market and not theatrical. And the reason for that was uh, New Jack City came out just before and there was a shooting in a movie theater. So when, when um, Holly, when, when, um, uh, the Five Heartbeats was coming out, they took the trailer and they, and they took out some of the violence in the trailer to make it seem more like a musical. So people said, oh, I don't want to go see that movie. It's going to be soft. And so Robert was, was just, just, just you know, torn up. And then some of the best scenes, they wanted to cut out of the movie. Um, and he kept them in on an instinct and he was right. And so for me, the lessons of the highs and lows of this business, and so it represents the perfect cautionary tale with the happy ending. So that's my absolute favorite one. Great, I'll be sure to check it out after this. And um, the next question we had uh, was, seeing the events transpiring around us over the past few weeks in the current political climate, do you have any advice for ways our audience can stay engaged and create impact for the communities around us? Sure. Um, I think that we all were disturbed at a minimal. I was outraged by what I saw when uh, George Floyd was murdered in front of our eyes by people who are supposed to protect and serve, by people who we pay their salaries to keep order. And it was callous, um, you know, our humanity was called forth. And so what you saw in the streets were people that were tired of being tired. And so they rose up in the way they knew how. What we tried to tell our mentees and hopefully succeeded is that, you know, it's important to, to, to get that anger out, but understand 
at some point it needs to turn very constructive. Now, there's a purpose to protest, peaceful protest. It gets attention, and we got a lot of attention. But it's important to turn that into stuff that's meaningful, anti-lynching bills and better opportunity, equal opportunity for women and minorities, equal pay. I mean, you can go, go through a list of inequities and address those. We helped some young people to create a nonprofit um, so they could fund useful information back out to others nationwide. We made a couple of videos to, and, and helped them to channel that way and tell their story. Um, I think that uh, each of us are good at something. I, I was just with a group um, yesterday and I was talking to them about what I call the divine puzzle. And so each of us are pieces in the divine puzzle. And each of us brings something unique. But you have to know who you are to know where you fit in the divine puzzle. And if you bring your piece and I bring my piece and Hannah brings her piece and Ermana brings her piece, Muhammad brings his piece, before you know it, we put that thing together and the picture's always love. And so we have to give love a chance. And I think by channeling our frustration and, and, and anger and upset into things that can build and provide equity and provide opportunity for everyone, then I think we're on the right path. Absolutely, that's very well put. And um, I'll do one more question from our end and then we'll open up the Q&A and Joshua will uh, moderate that. The next question that we have was um, the most memorable moment on set. The end. <laughs> <laughs> we had one film and we got it done. It's on Netflix now. It's called Love.com, The Social Experiment. And we messed around with that thing for a long time. And then, you know, so we finally got it done. And it's a nice film. It's a romantic comedy. Uh, Kim Whitley's in it, Lisa Ray, Tobias Trevelyan, uh, a few other notables. And um, we actually did a soundtrack for that one. It's on Spotify and iTunes. I'm actually singing on the last track, and I wrote the last two tracks. Um, but uh, finishing, finishing. Because remember, uh, movies are one of the few enterprises where you put all the money in, before you know what you're gonna get. So it's like imagine buying a pair of shoes and you never put them on your feet yet. And so you put all the money in, you hope it's gonna be good and people will like it. And you don't know what the timing is gonna be, if it's gonna hit right. I mean, this movie we just released on, on Friday, June 5th, One Angry Black Man, I couldn't have planned the timing better. I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm sorry that there was so much, you know, tragedy with the jogger getting killed, George Floyd, the young lady who was in her own home, and we could go on. But the pandemic, so people happened to be home. Um, it happened to be the week of the, the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa race riots. And so there was all this symbolic stuff and, 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 and tragic stuff happening. And then you had this film that explained most of it called One Angry Black Man. And so it came out, it was absolutely wonderful. And the, and the weekend was so strong that, they, that the uh, dis distribution company, um, Freestyle Digital Media, a Byron Allen company, they came out and said, hey, let's do theatrical. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, hey, let's go. And I love working with them because they understood the movie, they understood the kind of company that we were, that we are, they supported us. And so we put this movie out and um, it's doing really well. It's like the little engine that could, right? Uh, it's, it's beautiful. And, it, and it's not what you think. I mean, there's people from every ethnicity. Uh, it's one angry black man, but it's probably more white people, people in it than anybody. And it's an honest conversation. It takes place on a college campus. It's, it's a classroom and a, a, a black literature class where they're talking about these great writers and um, and current issues. And it's got some humor in it. It's got some tense parts in it. It's very authentic. I think if you, when you watch this movie, and please watch it, we need the revenue. But when you watch this movie, 
you'll see yourself in some of the characters or somebody you know, I promise you. We had people walking out, oh, thank you for respecting my intelligence. Uh, oh my God, best movie I've ever seen. We're on the top 10 list already for a number of movies, uh, for a number of, of leaders in the movie industry. So I'm really proud of it. I mean, as a business person, you know, it, it, there wasn't a whole lot of data to use to tell me if that was gonna be a success or not. So what we did was we found good people, we read and found some good scripts, and then we took a chance. At the end of the day, you take a chance on a lot of things in life. And um, I, I, I feel pretty confident that I'm gonna be very happy that I took a chance on this film. Great, it's great to hear that the movie's doing well. Everyone, please watch it. Um, I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Josh, and he'll handle the Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Michael, pleasure. Hi, Mr. Fulton. Um, hey. Lots of great stuff I already said. I've been taking notes um, and it's great to get the chance to talk to you today. Um, we have our first question from um, Varun. Uh, Varun, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. You can go ahead and ask uh, Mr. Fulton your question. Mr. Fulton, thank you so much for doing this. Um, oh, sure. So I was just wondering, like, do you have, like, on top of, like, knowing the business side, do you have, like, advice when it comes to producing, like, your first, like, feature film? Absolutely. Jump in. Uh, there is a book, there's a short version of a film book by a guy named Adam Leipzig, L-E-I-P-Z-I-G. He's a professor at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley. He also did 34 movies, including the highest grossing two documentaries. He also did Dead Poets Society, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, uh, was an executive at Disney. I call him my movie Yoda. Yeah. Um, Adam and I are working together with about I don't know, 20 or so other advisors to build the first online uh, film school with actual transcripts from the UC system. It's called Media U. We'll launch it next year. Uh, but any of his books on the film industry will help you. And there's a big one. And then there's a, there's like a, a, a 90 page one that you can read in a night. Read that book. It'll tell you everything you need to know. And then get started. The most important thing, though, is to get started. Um, I remember when I was talking to the founder of Netflix and he said the biggest mistake he saw young entrepreneurs make is that they build this castle of a business plan in their head and they never do anything. The difference between the way I work and many others is that at some point I get out and I start doing the work. There's a governor that lives down the hall in our condo and Steven Spielberg stayed here when he filmed Lincoln and Deborah Martin Chase stayed here when she did Harriet. And, um, and he said, BK, the reason that you have so many different things that are, and they're all working is because you're doing the work. You don't just talk about it. And so I encourage you to get going. Um, I remember watching this uh, documentary and had George Lucas in it. And one of the things that I loved was when he did Star Wars, you know what he started with? A notepad and a pencil. And he sat down and started writing. Professional writers are just amateurs that didn't quit. It's in you. Don't wait for someone to evaluate you to decide who you are supposed to be. You get to decide that. And so just start. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. You're welcome, Varun. And one more thing, one more thing. When I made my 50 year plan, I went and I, I thought about who do I respect? And I went and looked at their short bio, take the Wikipedia version, and I took three people and I pulled out the common denominators. What did each one of them do? And I made sure I did that. So as a, if you wanna produce, if you wanna do docs or you wanna do feature films or shorts, then you look up three or four people who've done exactly what you wanna do, exactly. And then you look at their blueprint. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can look at what we did. You know, we're, we, we, we're probably the most prolific independent film company in the, in the United States. Four films in our first year. We'll do another four this year. I already got three or four on deck for next year. Um, we did eight books last year. I've got 
I'll be writing, uh, finishing two novels on vacation next week. Um, we're launching the first app that will allow people to go to the movies, IMAX, and pay for all their digital streaming services by just watching ads. Can you imagine you never have to play for your Netflix anymore? You never have to play for HBO Go or HBO Max, Disney Plus, you never have to pay for our movies. You have our app pre-show, you just look at it, watch the ad, go to the movies, virtual credit card. It's crazy cool, people are gonna, it's gonna blow people's mind. And they're like, how are they doing that? And so, but again, you just gotta do the work and you get better and better at it. Before we created our magazine, Soul Vision Magazine, people said, oh, how are you gonna do that? Nobody has a magazine, nobody wants to read another magazine. 100,000 readers later, and a year and a half, we got a magazine. I said, hey, I want to do a TV network. Oh man, it costs too much money. It's gonna be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And where are you gonna get the content from? And blah, blah, blah. 400 hours, baby. Every mobile phone in the world. Check, done. Gonna do movies. Gonna have actors in my movies. First movie, John Cusack, Tay Diggs, George Lopez, Luke Hemsworth, first movie. So again, don't let anybody talk you out of your dream. Thank you once again. That was very, very helpful. That was a great question, awesome advice, and certainly very versatile advice that anyone could uh, apply um, going into their industry. Um, our next question um, is speaking to the intersection of media and justice. There's a lot of false news out there but social media platforms have also been so meaningful during the past couple of months and weeks especially. What do you think the media's role should be or what should media producers be doing right now to promote a more inclusive narrative? Well, I think it's up to every generation, as I said, to use the tools of your time. I think historically the news has been a bit of a one-to-many experience. I think what we, what we get to be a part of in 2020 is the news being more many to many. We all have cameras, we all have these, this, 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 these phones on our cameras, these computers and laptops and connectivity, so we can tell certain stories. I mean, very often I find out things on the internet before they hit major news. Now you have to learn how to discern, to make sure stuff is, is, is fact versus fiction, but at the end of the day, I think the news has to continue to do what they do, but they should shift away from just pure um, ambulance chasing and car wreck news. What you often find with news is that they're finding the worst of stories. So, so let's say one of you goes out and, and invents something really special that helps you know, the kids in your community, that's not likely to get covered. But if you go take a brick and go throw it through the bank window, downtown in, in your area, you're going to be on the news. And I'm like, so what are we encouraging here? You know, you got to do something crazy and you get on the news, you do something good and it's like, blah, you know. And so I think the news can help because, because it's media is so powerful. But I think what's happening is the people are taking control of what they intake. And so the news is going to have to compete with a billion, seven billion cameras potentially. I think the other thing that really is important and really needs to happen is, is more balance. They need to show more women and minorities as, as experts. Um, they need to tell more stories. Like I saw a couple of pictures of some of the peaceful protesters protecting police or the police joining or men of mixed ethnicity, age, kneeling together in suits. So not this image of thugs or this image of people that are just, just kind of opportunist. And I think, you know, so here's the thing, and I, and I don't wanna, I mean, I, I love reporters or I have a lot of friends in that business, so I don't wanna disparage them, but I'm clear about what sells papers and what appears not to sell papers. And if you want, and a fire sells more papers than a, a clear day. And so we have to be mindful of that. The people have to become more sophisticated consumers of all media, whether it's from the news or from what they see on social media, because a challenge with social media is your 
you know, 5,000 friends or your group of people that follow you, it becomes a silo, an echo chamber for a limited point of view, a singular point of view. And that can be dangerous because you never get those points of views or stereotypes challenged. And that's where you get these weird ideologies. That's where you get the indoctrination. So on the one hand, we grew up in a place that told us stuff that wasn't always true. And then we find these silos where we reinforce the stuff we think we believe. And um, so we all have to take it upon ourselves to ask more from our major media and ask more of ourselves. That, that's really interesting. And um, I think that's it's very applicable with the times going on. Certainly so many news channels are like that. Um, like this past semester, I was reading a book called Factfulness, which was all about the negative reporting um, on media and how it can create a sort of a bubble. Um, our next question is from Nicole Luz. She says, last semester I took a class on black representation in the US media. And one thing we discussed was how there seems to be a genre of movies that are black movies that are mostly catered to watched to slash watched by a black audience. The black students in my class said that they liked this because they felt that they had something that was really theirs. My question is, is your goal for your movies to cater to a broader audience and spread a broader message slash educate? Or do you think there is a value in catering specifically to a black audience so that um, none of the story's value is lost to appease white viewers? I find it to be an interesting question. Um, Solidify is about unity of the human species. So all of our movies are multi-ethnic, multi-generational. Uh, they're designed for everyone. Our TV network was interesting. People came to us and said, well, 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 who are you catering toward? Black, right? Nope. Urban, right? Nope. I've got cartoons. I've got 98-year-old white women. I've got black kids. We got everybody on our show because that's the world we live in. We're more connected now. Look at this group. It's not just black. You didn't say, let's do a black program for people who will just appreciate black stuff. That's hard to do, you know? And so God bless folk if they feel like they need to do that, but that's, that's not what we're about. I'm about inclusivity because here's the thing, and, and, I'm, and I'm being selfish. You know why I want all of you to succeed? Because if all of you succeed, as I get older, I hope you invent something so I can still dunk the basketball, okay? I hope you do something so that I can eat what I want and live another 50 years. If I just invest in people that look like me, if I just invest in my little circle, then I miss the opportunity to get the benefit of your blessing, the benefit of what you bring to the table. That's the problem with inequality. You miss all the good stuff that other people bring. And it's a lot of good stuff. And so for me, our movies, as long as I'm the chairman and CEO, our movies will try to speak to everybody. It will speak to your humanity. There will be medicine in them. There will be stories, often true stories or, 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 or stories based on true characters. And the, the fun thing is there's so many stories that haven't been told that I can pick the best of the best. Let me give you an example. So I'm working on a, a movie about a guy named Joseph Ballon Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Ever, anybody ever heard about Saint-Georges? All right, check this out. And I'm gonna have Denzel Washington to play old Saint-Georges, Terrence Howard to play middle age, and I got this guy out of London who plays the violin to play young Saint-Georges. What if I told you that in the late 1700s, the champion fencer of all of Europe was a mulatto, mixed African and Guadeloupe? What if I told you that Saint Georges was also a virtuoso on the violin? Marie Antoinette asked him to head the Symphony of France. Mozart went to France to learn from the greats. Chavalier was the greatest. He lived in the same building with Chavalier. He learned a lot from Chavalier. What if I told you that Chavalier had a legion of a thousand? 
African and mixed race swashbucklers who fought for France and fought for him. One of his lieutenants in the Legion was T. Alexander Dumas, father of Alexander Dumas, who wrote what? The Count of Monte Cristo and the Three Musketeers. So wait a minute. The cornerstones of French literature, influencer of Mozart and, the, and the, one of the greatest composers of his time, and the current stance in fencing all from the same guy and nobody's ever heard about it. So those are the kind of stories that we'll get to tell. The world is rich, it's full of them. And because it was unpopular to tell the story of a non-European throughout a big part of our history, some of those older stories you just don't get. They're stories from India. I've got a business partner in Mumbai. We're working on stories. They're stories from Mexico and Russia, and China, and Argentina, Alaska, all over the world, anywhere there are human beings, there have been stories that have inspired them. And, if, and since we're all humans, we can find inspiration from some of these stories too. It's just that the indoctrination side of pedagogy made us believe or, or only allowed us to experience certain stories. And those stories weren't designed to help everyone to be great. They were designed to help a few people to be great, even if the stories weren't true. That's the problem with indoctrination and racism, is that people will be misinformed, will accept being misinformed so that it fits their worldview. The truth sets us all free. The truth brings us together. And so I want to work on truth. The truth is that we're all cousins trying to find our way home. We're the same human family sharing one rock. So my films will be about all of us. That's amazing, Mr. Fulton. That's, I, I, really, um, I really like that message and I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's a good thing that a lot of films or with with today's day and age, a lot of people have brought more attention to um, those who are voiceless during their times. Um, our next uh, question is: After all your success throughout your career, what keeps you motivated to keep going? I've got a really beautiful wife who loves me and makes me feel happy, and so that's part of what keeps me going. I have three wonderful boys that my wife and I are trying to, well, young men now, they're 22 and 28, uh, twins are 22, and we want to see a, a world that's open for them so they can grow up safe. After what happened to Mr. Floyd, I got frightened. I couldn't sleep for two days and worried about my kids. Um, I almost got shot when I was 23, about their age. I was in New York in graduate school. I mean, I was coming from class and an officer drew down on me saying that I had robbed somebody in the subway. It was ridiculous. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic, um, but I, I, I want to contribute to a better world. I want to build pools that I never swim in. I want young people to know how to have the how to become the best version of themselves so I, I stay motivated because i think you know god blesses all of us to turn our dreams and ideas into their tangible equivalents but you have to have the faith be willing to do the work and expect the outcome so you got to do that work and i know so much now while i have quality time remaining i can still move my limbs and still um you know say the things that i'm actually thinking I, want, I feel like I'm not doing enough. So I accelerated the pace of output. People say, why are you doing so much? Why are you staying up so late? Why are you emailing at three or four o'clock in the morning? And I say, I work while you sleep so I can live like you dream. And then they began to get it. At the end of the day, doing the work is critically important. Helping others along the way is critically important. None of us know it all. 
none of us. I, I, I can learn from a baby. I mean, it was funny, I was reading, a, um, almost finished the book on Leonardo da Vinci, and, um, and it talks about how he would observe birds and children walking, but it wasn't just kind of, I'm bird watching. It's, do the wings go higher on the upswing or go lower on the downswing? Are the rear feathers pointing out or pointing in? And so it was a level of detail and granularity that feels familiar to me because I'm kind of like that. I, I, I think I'm partially dyslexic. Um, I know um, uh, Da Vinci was, uh, Leonardo Da Vinci was dyslexic. And I, I used to mix up numbers sometimes and I definitely mix up names. I'm real, I have a photo memory, so I remember everything that I see. But sometimes I'll call you, you know, you're Joshua, I have a son named Joshua, so it's easy to remember. But if, you know, if, if your name wasn't on the screen, you might be Jamie, <laughs> Jody. <laughs> so you just got to forgive me on that. I, I do it with love, but it's just my brain just doesn't always capture that. Now, I can tell you everything else, and that's the crazy thing. I can remember stuff back from childhood, and I can see around the corner a little bit. Um, the other thing that keeps me motivated uh, is that I have so much hope because I know what is possible. I mean, can you imagine knowing how to create your future? So I say, okay, I want a magazine, and now there's a magazine. I want a TV network. Now we have a TV network. I want to make four movies. Nobody's ever done that before. It doesn't matter. I'm going to make all four. And now we're on 12. So I am having fun. So the, so, so the person that says, you know, why are you up? And I tell them that I, I, um, I work while you sleep so I can live like a dream. There's always a smarty pants to say, well, you can't be having any fun. I never see you at the club. And then you know what I say back to them? Right. I'm having lots of fun. And by the way, I never see you at the bank. Oh. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm sure it leaves them speechless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of the things I want to do is make being intelligent cool. We've let people flip the script and somehow not having your stuff together is considered desirable. Get out of here. You know, you want my life. So, and I can show you how to get it. All those guys that I played ball with in school, hey, can I get a job? When I was running the phone company at 44,000 employees, hey, you're doing really good. I'm glad you stuck with it. Can I get a job, blah, blah, blah. And so I tell my kids, look, just don't, don't follow that, that silliness. Do the work. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. That's a quote from Arthur Ashe. And it's really, really great advice. At the end of the day, if you leave this session with nothing else, leave with knowing that you are enough and that you can do whatever you choose. That is the promise of life and being a human being. And it's a wonderful thing once you really realize how to maximize it. We're, we're so lucky to have you today, Mr. Fulton. Um, this is great advice. And the whole reason we want to put together these events is so that we can, well, one, because we're all co-founders in our or like young 20s, trying to also find out a way how to get to where people like you've reached. And also, we wanted to provide that opportunity for other people. And it's been so useful um, advice you've given today. So we have a, a last question from Ermana. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Mr. Fulton, uh, Fulton, sorry. Um, so you've had, I mean, first of all, thank you for giving us this opportunity to answer our questions and give us some insight into um, what we wanna do and going for our passions because that's why I'm really here. Um, I also graduated with an engineering degree two years ago, but after two years, I feel like maybe I want to change gears into something else that goes aligned with my passion, and that's with music and art, and that's what you've done too. So um, 
I wanted to ask, I mean, you have many accomplishments, accomplishments under your sleeve and what helped you change gears into going towards what is more of your passion and did you have any doubt in yourself and how did you overcome, overcome that doubt? Um, and what motivated you to keep going, even though you had some of that doubt? Right, right. Well, you have, you have, you have like 20 questions in that one question, but I love <laughs> the question. I love the question. It's a great question, a great question to close on. So um, for me, I don't know that it was as much as a, as a, of a change as one would think. So I started out with the whole engineering thing because I figured I could get a job in that and that I kind of suppressed my writing skills, but they were there. And I remember I was working at Virginia Tech in the student center at night and I would always write these funny things in the log book for the night manager. And people said I'd never read the, the book before until I started writing it. It was so funny that they started coming to read my night manager's log. Matter of fact, I should try to find them because it'd probably be worth something one day. You know, because I mean, I wrote stuff and I made it, I wrote poems and I wrote about the funny things that happened on my watch while I was an engineering student. And so um, what ended up happening then was I had an opportunity to blend my math and science talent with the art. So see what we didn't talk about today in addition to the movie stuff, I also am the chairman of two cybersecurity companies. And we have the only method patent in the world for variable language encryption at the machine level, at the zero and one level. So every operating system, every app, every um, iOS and all of that run on top of it, no matter what language. So it's, 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 it's agnostic as the language by design. It's 10 to the 512. That's a quantum level encryption. And it works. We have that. Um, my augmented reality company won the 5G challenge. We had a million dollar check in January. 525 businesses competed against us. And so what I'm saying is, I think that the art and the science go together. Again, be water. The, the, the world is this mix of things. It's not science or art. It's science and art, you know. It's not math or music, it's math and music. So these skill sets are, are, are part of the same ecosystem and we're just choosing to play one a little more than the other. And what I've learned to do is, 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 is pull what's required. So I might be in a meeting and we're talking about movies. I say, hmm. I, there's an app for that. And then we make pre-show. I'll be in a meeting and we'll talk about, you know, spatial co-location and recognition. And then we'll create an augmented reality company that wins major awards. And so I think that you don't have to choose. It's nothing wrong with going through the widest door open because that's the way opportunities work, you know, Maybe the companies are really hiring a particular for a, for a particular skill set that you have. And so you seize that opportunity and you learn and you develop and then you morph that into other things. At, I remember my, my movie Yoda, Adam. I said, Adam, I wrote all eight of the, I wrote seven children's books in one month. And then it took the rest of the time for the illustrator to catch up. So I started drawing the pictures for him so he wouldn't have to do as much translation. And I said, it's easy for me. Now, Adam's a little older than me. He said, BK, it's easy for you now because you actually know how to do stuff. And so he was like, you know, don't discount that you're crazy smart. So that was a nice compliment. But I believe everybody is as smart as the next person. They just don't know it yet. And so that's why I want to develop everybody because I want your art brain and your engineering brain, you know, it's a 24 hours in the day is a long time. Now, my beautiful wife will tell you that I don't sleep much. So I'll do my science and I'll do my writing. And, um, and so you find room for both. And what's amazing when you're a highly productive person is it takes out a lot of time for nonsense. So that person who wanted me to be at the club, they can have the club. Because 
I really like being able to go to the bank. Thank you.